All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish. My name is Jeremiah Roberts, one of the co-hosts here. I am joined by my trusty co-host and super sleuth of the show, Andrew. It's good to have you back for part two. Thank you. It's good to be back. Uh, last episode was a blast uh, with our brother here, and I can't wait to learn a little bit more. Awesome. Hey, real quickly. Hey, Gabe, I'm not seeing Andrew. Uh, I'm only seeing my mug. Okay. I know I have a giant head, but like seeing on the big screen is a bit is a bit overwhelming. <laughs> anyways, um, yeah, here we go. Uh, so, anyways, let me start again. All right, I'm joined by Andrew, the super sloth of the show. Uh, it's good to have you here with us in part two. Thank you. It's good to be back, man. Last episode was a blast. I can't wait to go uh, dig into more some of uh, Islamic history here, man. It's gonna be good. Awesome. We're back with James. Good to have you back, my friend. Good to be back. Uh, real quick before we jump in, uh, tell us the YouTube channel where people can find you if they want to find out more about you. Yeah, so you can find us at the Almeida Initiative. Um, that's A L M A I D A H, um, or you can just kind of Google my name. Might be might be easier. It's James Raymond R A Y M E N T. Excellent. And so we in the first episode we were just kind of talking about some of the origins uh, in the ancient world of, of how uh, Islam sort of came to the forefront, including you know Muhammad and some of the political uh, geopolitical uh, events at the time and how that all came together. Uh, we are going to be focusing in this episode kind of where uh, Islam went uh, post Muhammad after he died uh, and what the Islamic world looked like. That really kind of could be a good catalyst towards the rest of the stuff we're going to talk about. Uh, so let me just jump off of this. So with Muhammad, like, did he die of natural causes? I mean, I think of like Joseph Smith, for example, he had a very dramatic death. He like, he went out in dramatic fashion, right? Um, that's someone I'm doing, again, we're doing a little bit of a parallel there. Like what, what was his, what sort of like, how did it work out for him? I'm just curious. Oh, yeah, th this was dramatic as well. Oh. And, you know, most Muslims, you know, I've met don't necessarily like know this because it's not something they kind of focus on. So I'm not trying to be salacious with any of these details here. Um, but if you don't believe anything I'm saying, look this up. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. This is in Sahih Muslim. Those are not sources that Shia believe. Um, um, but I'll get to the sort of Shia position in this as we go. Mm -hmm. But essentially, two years before his death, Muhammad is fighting against a Jewish fortress slash oasis called Kaibar. And Muhammad defeats them, um, you know, kills most of the men in the battle, um, and then takes the women and children as captives. And as he's doing this, after his victory, there's a Jewish woman named Zainab who offers to host a kind of conciliatory feast. And uh, as they're sitting there, um, she poisons his favorite part of the lamb, which is the shoulder. And as, um, as, as Muhammad is eating, the companion next to him falls down dead. And then he spits out what he's eating from his mouth. And it says, everyone, stop eating. It is inform me that it is poisoned. So he summons this Jewish woman into the room and says, what possessed you to do this? And she says, you have killed my grandfathers and my fathers and my brothers and my sons. If you were a prophet, you'd have known this was poisoned. But if you were a king, then I would rid the people of you. Hmm. And so wow. he got a small dose of the poison, but according to the Islamic sources, this started a sickness and he was never the same after this and was basically kind of in constant pain. And that's what he died of two years later. Um, some Shia believe that it was actually um, Aisha and Hafsa, the, his wives, who poisoned him with the with the help of their you know, with the help of their father, so they could gain power. Um, not all Shias believe that, but that's kind of a common theory that kind of goes around. But according to the Sunni sources, um, it was poison he got from the Battle of Khyber. Hmm. And again, it's it's like. There's there's a lot of you know debates and ideas around this, and uh, I would encourage anybody to go read the sources themselves rather than you know immediately dismissing or believing what I have to say about it. Hmm. Um, yeah. So where's uh, so after so after he passes away, most of the times historically in religious movements and at a whole, 
there's usually a fight for power. There's there's sort of a vacuum that gets filled in. Successorship, you think about the difference between like Brigham Young, uh, you know, Emma Smith, and, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, how that fragmented. That's always the case. So after, so post-Muhammad passing away, after this sort of long extended uh, thing, like what what was, um, yeah, where did it go from there? So um, like we covered on the last episode, um, his kind of best friend, uh, Abu Bakr, mm-hmm. think of him as like the Brigham Young of Islam. Yeah. Um, he doesn't claim to be a prophet, um, but everybody's kind of, you know, mourning and he kind of comes and he stands out in front of everyone and says, if you worship Muhammad, then you should be sad because Muhammad is dead. Mm-hmm. But if you worship Allah, do not grieve because Allah is very much alive and never dies. Um, and he kind of takes this sort of mantle of leader of the Muslim community, this mantle of caliph. And Ali believes he should be the caliph. But initially, when Abu Bakr claims power, Ali is a team player and joins in with that. Mm-hmm. So the fracture is is immediately um, resolved. But um, Mecca and Medina stay Muslim. But then basically all the other parts of Arabia say, all right, we followed Muhammad, but we're not going to follow you. We don't want to pay your taxes anymore. We're going to appoint our own prophets. So that leads to a one-year war known as the Ridda Wars or the Apostate Wars, Hmm. where Abu Bakr sends the Muslim armies all over Arabia and basically defeats these, you know, prophetic claimants and and uh, and, and kind of you know, reunifies everything. And this is a significant time because um, we'll try not to laugh too much here, but this ends in something called the Battle of Yamama. <laughs> um, wow. And th- it's a significant battle because yeah. as we've established up to this point, the Quran is not written down. Um, it's all memorized. Yeah. And um, 800, according to the Islamic sources, 800 soldiers who had memorized the Quran died in that battle. So um, Omar and Abu Bakr decide if we don't do something, we're in danger of losing the Quran um, if people keep dying. So they then start writing it down and gathering you know, various pieces people have written down and they gather it all and give it to Hafsa, um, Muhammad's widow, Omar's daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, it has everything except for two of the chapters. So that's the first written gathering of the Quran. That's about two years after Muhammad's death. Um, so Abu Bakr reestablishes political control and then the Muslims start fighting wars against both the Sassanid Persian Empire and the Byzantine Roman Empire and they're winning basically every battle they're in because you have these you know the, one the empires are kind of exhausted from fighting each other mm-hmm. but also these you know desert Bedouins who have you know lived off the bare minimum of the land and can you know cross the deserts and have great supply lines in this battle ethic which is like victory or martyrdom mm-hmm. you know just become this unstoppable force in the ancient world much like the vikings were and they are basically winning victory after victory but abu Bakr was an old man when he took the job and abu Bakr, abu Bakr, you know died of natural causes and probably be the you know the last muslim leader in a while to do so uh and then Omar took over and Omar was hardcore. Like, you know, he's like the ultimate micromanager. He, he lives kind of as an ascetic, right? He's the most powerful man in the world at this point. And he kind of like, you know, lives a very simple life and, and he kind of insists that everyone else does as well. So, you know, as the armies conquer Jerusalem and as they start conquering, you know, his, under him, they conquer all the Sassanid empires, but he's like, breathing down everyone's necks, being like, all right, you collected this much tax money, where did it go? Mm. Uh, why are you wearing silk? That's not what a public official should be wearing. You should be dressed simply, right? Things yeah. like this. So much so that his own son is caught publicly drunk and he gives him like, you know, 80 lashes with you know, the whip and ends up killing his own son for being publicly drunk. That's double the prescribed amount for mm. that crime. Yeah. So the... Um, so, so under him, the Muslim empire is very effective. It takes over Egypt. It takes over Jerusalem. It takes over, you know, all of Persia and Iraq, um, and it's just unstoppable. Um, but like towards the end of that, some people who resent him for destroying the Sassanid empire, 
we'll call them our Sassanid assassins, show up to the mosque when Omar is leading the prayers and they attack him with a poison sword. And they don't kill him right away, but the poison does its job. And as he's dying, he basically selects this you know, council of men who he thinks would be good candidates for the next leader. And one of them he chooses um, is Ali, who the Shia believe should have been the successor in the beginning. And another guy is a guy called Uthman, who was basically the kind of like Muhammad's rich friend who <laughs> like basically kind of lives by the proverb, money answers everything. Right. Um, and he, you know, he's really good. Everyone loved this guy, right? And so, you know, while Omar is le- le- leading this sort of ascetic life, Uthman is living in his palace, eating sumptuously, you know, every day. And after 10 years of being, like, I think 12 years of being micromanaged by Omar, people want a break. So they you decide not to pick Ali. They choose Uthman instead. Mm-hmm. And Uthman's significant because he is the one that finally collates the Quran um, mostly as we know it today. Um, the, the Quran has vowel pointing and Uthman's did not because there was no vowel pointing at the time, but it has the same number of surahs and orders, uh, order of chapters in the Quran. Mm-hmm. Surah is just the, the sort of word for chapter. Yeah. Um, ayah is the word for verse. So Uthman collects all this um, because the Muslim empire is growing at this point. Before it was just in Arabia, everybody kind of got it. Mm. But then they're concerned that as Islam spreads, people might start to kind of like, you know, miss things and take things out of context or, you know, make up parts. So basically he gathers together all the manuscripts. He makes one official state Quran and burns everything else. Mm -hmm. So no one can come and say, hey, I have the true Quran, basically. But through his, generally through his governance, right? Uthman is the guy that can kind of fix any situation. So much so, there's a guy who um, is his brother-in-law who converted to Islam and moved to uh, Medina with the Muslims. And he was, um, he, was a, uh, he was a scribe for Muhammad. And then he decided that he wasn't Muslim anymore, left Medina, went to Mecca and said, I believe in lots of gods again. Hmm. And when Muhammad took over Mecca, he was one of the few people that he actually demanded this guy's execution. Yeah. So this guy goes to Uthman and Uthman brings him to Muhammad. And Uthman is like, oh, just say the Pledge of Allegiance to Muhammad. And he says the Pledge of Allegiance and Muhammad just stands there staring at him, saying nothing. Hmm. And again, say the Pledge of Allegiance. He says it, Muhammad doesn't acknowledge him. Then finally, he's, you know, he sends the Pledge of Allegiance a third time and Muhammad says, okay, I accept your Pledge of Allegiance. And then Uthman and his brother-in-law you know, leave and um, then, uh, you know, the Muhammad's like, I didn't answer him twice. Why don't one of you cut his head off? Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, we don't, we can't read your mind. Why don't you gesture or something? And he's like, it's not right for a prophet to have sort of deceptive eyes. Right. So Muhammad spares him because of Uthman's advocacy for him, basically, even though he didn't really want to. So Uthman is like a great guy to know, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, if Muhammad demands your death, Uthman is like the one guy that can get you off the hook. Yeah. Um, but um, um, that guy who he got off the hook, he actually appoints him governor of Egypt. And he basically appoints all of his relatives to governorships of different provinces. And his cousin is the governor of Damascus in Syria. And one day his cousin shows up to the mosque drunk. Um, and Uthman won't even fire the guy. So this, so unlike Omar, right, who punished his own son to the point of death, Uthman won't even, you know, fire the guy from his job who he's related to. Yeah. So he's too easygoing, um, and that's why people picked him because they were sick of being micromanaged. But at this point, um, Aisha, Muhammad's widow, starts stirring up unrest against against Uthman, mm-hmm. um, and then um, her half brother. Um, who is now Ali's adopted son and Abu Bakr, the first caliph's biological son, um, he leads a rebellion against Uthman, goes into his house, and this results in Uthman's death. So Uthman, this generous, well-connected guy, 
is murdered in his own home by a mob of people. And now uh, then they're going to figure out who's going to be the leader now. So Ali is kind of like the one competent guy left in Medina. So finally, the guy that she is think should be in charge is actually put in charge. Mm -hmm. And so everybody, you know, likes Ali, but they have a different interpretation of his, you know, role. Right. So, so Ali is, uh, Ali is the caliph, but, um, Uthman's cousin, a guy called Muawiyah, yeah, wants justice for Uthman, mm. and the murderer, the leader of the mob, is Ali's adopted son, mm -hmm. and basically he says, "I want justice." And Ali says, "If you find me the person who stuck the knife in, I'll execute them. But I'm not going to ex I'm not going to execute 600 people." Mm -hmm. And so Aisha then is frustrated with, or even though she kind of st started staring up unrest against Uthman, does not like how things went. And she stirs up, um, you know, stirs up a rebellion against Ali. Yeah. And they may have some previous beef uh, because at one point, Aisha was accused of adultery. And as Muhammad was trying to figure out what to do, Ali was like, you know, do what you want to do, but there's lots of other women out there kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know that that may have not played into it at all. They may mm -hmm. be completely past that. This might be something new, but there's definitely this sort of inter-family politics at play here. Yeah, and Ali, and so Aisha actually starts a war with Ali, and like you know, a woman in the you know six hundreds leads an army while riding on the back of an armored camel, kind of like yelling out orders. So Ali engages the army and defeats her. But you know, spares her, and she kind of fades into obscurity at that point. But after Ali's forces are depleted, Muawiyah, Uthman's cousin, comes and he starts um, another war with Ali, and they fight a battle called the Battle of Sifin. Now Ali is kind of like you know, he's Captain Islam. He's kind of unstoppable. He's you know pious. He's the best possible you know warrior. He's like the ideal Muslim in people's imagination, right? Mm -hmm. And Ali is kind of unstoppable in the battlefield. Um, but Muawiyah is gifted in a different type of way. And after you know, a day of losing, the next day, Muawiyah sends his frontline troops with verses of the Quran strapped to their chests. And Ali's super pious troops will not strike the Quran so that they, they, that they lose, right? Wow. So... Andrew, let me let me ask this, and now because this is the question I was like, you got me thinking, is that so? You've got all this tribal warfare going on, really for succession, but you also have finally the Quran going from an oral tradition to being like written down. So, in the process of all this tribal warfare, was there even the was there unilateral agreement on what was actually like written down? Like, was the, did they agree with like all the surahs were were Correct. You think about like Catholics and Protestants differ on like what the canon was. Uh huh. Were the different sects who are fighting for power? Did they were they all sort of unilaterally decided? Okay, this is canon, but we're just fighting over like who is the true successor. Um. Yes and no. So, um, all the sects that survive believe in the same Quran, right? There were groups like I was a guy called Ibn Masud, who was a prominent Quran. Uh, translator who kind of resisted the collection of the Quran and didn't like what they were doing. There's a guy called Ubay ibn Kaab, um, who had, you know, a couple more surahs in there. Mm -hmm. Ibn Masud had less. Yeah. Um, they disagreed, but no there's no like surviving factions there. Um so when the Quran was collated by Uthman, Ali was part of the state. Right. So he so he was Uthman's advisor. And you can go and kind of read the conversations they have about, you know, Ali kind of giving Uthman advice in Al Tabari. So um, Sunnis and Shias do not differ on the Quran because while the seeds of the division are there, we haven't gotten there yet. Hmm. Um, this this is still we're at the point where this still could have been solvable. Yeah. Um, but it does not get solved. Yeah. Because Ali basically, after this battle, is they're kind of at a stalemate. So Ali basically agrees to kind of work with Muawiyah and sort of split the territory between them. 
uh, on the condition that Muawiyah lets the next caliph be decided by the council of elders rather than just appointing his son as the caliph. Yeah. And Muawiyah agrees to these terms. Um, but then some of Ali's own people called the Karajites were so frustrated with Ali capitulating that they killed Ali. Um, so Ali was assassinated by his own men. Um, so again, that helps for a minute there because it wasn't the other side that killed him, right? It was his own side. Um, and th then, so then Ali's sons come to an agreement with Muawiyah that, okay, we'll just kind of honor our father's terms um, as long as um, you don't kill as long as you don't appoint your successor as your son, then we're mm -hmm. good. Yeah. And he agrees to this. Um, and, but, you know, so the two sons of Ali, Hassan and Hussein, the grandsons of Muhammad, Hassan mysteriously dies through poisoning. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, Hussein lives. And as Muawiyah is dying, he says, Ah, oh, my son shall be my successor. Right. Which, you know, kicks the whole thing off again which frustrates a lot of people. So his son Yazid becomes the caliph. And what happens at that point is um, Hussein is summoned to a place called Kufa in Iraq. And he's told the people of the city are with you. We need to save the Muslim community from this corrupt government. Um, we, will, we will follow you. Um, so Hussein goes to Kufa to kind of meet this army. And it turns out to be like 70 people. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not the army he thought it was. Yeah. So, so the forces of Yazid are coming. He's getting ready to fight them. But at this point, it's not a battle. It's a massacre. And Hussein and his son are, you know, you know, slaughtered at something called Karbala, um, which is something the Shia remember every year, where the the son of Ali and his grandson are killed at Karbala, and the family of the Prophet taken into. Um, you're taken into um, your know, captivity, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so that there, that incident there, is the one that cements the rift between the Sunni and Shia factions. There, the Shias believing that Ali and his descendants are the proper leaders of the Muslim community, um, and then the Sunnis believing that the community as a whole is rightly guided, and we have to kind of basically do follow the sort of mind of the group. Yeah. rather than one specific family in that. Um, and so while the Quran is the same, basically everything that comes after is you know, different. Not in, not in the sense of like, you know, how, you know, like what, the, what all the ethics are, but there are going to be subtle mm -hmm. differences. Um, and, but their view on history is very different. Yeah. What's up, everybody? It's the Super Sleuth here, letting you know that you can go to shopcultish.com and get all of our exclusive cultish merch. There's the Bad Theology Hurts People shirt. Jerry wears it all the time. I wear it all the time. Sometimes we wear it at the same time without even trying to have that happen on the show. And we're just like, whoa, you're wearing the shirt. I'm wearing the shirt. You could wear the shirt too. Go to shopcultish.com today and get your exclusive cultish merch. Talk to you later, guys. Andrew, you, you see, yeah, do you see a similarity, Andrew? And I'll let you jump in here. The uh, difference, I was just thinking immediately about that fragmentation between the Sunnis and Shias, the uh, Joseph Smith's death and the separation between Emma and Brigham Young. And you saw uh, somewhat adherence to the same revelation, but then there was a differentiation in, in, in between uh, succession. I don't know, what, what else did you recognize there? What else is on your mind with everything he's, James has been saying? This is so fascinating. Yeah, it's ex it's extremely fascinating. Yeah, to to back up a little bit, I do see that that similarity, uh, Jerry, because I think the the um, underpinning is the same, right? There's a prophet, prophet dies, and then revelation can either continue or it can just stay where it is within Mormonism. It's progressive revelation, so they're assuming the mantle of a prophet to get revelation from God, whereas Muhammad was this final prophet. Uh, but I want to back up a little bit to Aisha. Is this the same one that Muhammad married at like six or nine years old? Yeah. So according to all of the Sunni sources, um, he was. She was six when they uh, you know, arranged the marriage, and nine when they consummated the marriage. Wow. So, so in terms of this interfamily conflict that we were seeing here, how in the midst of all of this, uh, 
conflict were they still able to conquest right i, I feel like a nation if they were to see these things coming from the outside be like this is where they're the weakest we need to attack them and we need to take control but somehow even during through this interrelational conflict they're having within themselves they were still able to conquer more and more land because look, looking things up it seems that the only other government that has like been this successful in conquest with speed and the extent of which they conquest had the conquest was alexander the great like so even during this time with all this conflict within themselves they were still conquering great places of land it's yeah fascinating yeah i mean what's crazy is how fast this is all happening i mean we're on you know basically civil war three and um <laughs> this is like less than 60 years after muhammad's death right um right but I think ba basically what you, what you really have is they're not usually happening at the exact same time. They're um, like the initial conquests, um, the initial massive conquests happen basically right away um, before you have any major division, right? So under under the first four, who the, the Muslims call the rightly guided caliphs, they're basically you know, one unstoppable force. And most of that conquest happens in Omar's reign. So Omar is the guy who's taking territory and organizing everything. Uthman is kind of making everything more wealthy and collecting the Quran. And then, you know, it's really by his death that the wars really start, which has given them, you know, a solid, you know, 10 years to kind of build. Um, and so you do have these kind of collapses um, and rebuildings. Um, but... You know, it, but all the way is these like the Sassanid Empire is gone, right? So there's no Sassanid threat. So the only viable opponent they have at this point is, are the Byzantines, and they have their own sort of you know power struggles as well. So they just never are able to quite you know get on their feet, basically. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is crazy that people didn't take more advantage of this. Hmm. Now that that yeah. That's crazy. I mean, it's it's hard to. I mean, this is just so. There's so many different components going on. So you, then again, you have the fragmentations of the of the Sunnis uh, and Shias, and so now it's now, but it's still really the same Quran, and but now it's just a matter of like who who is actually the utilizing catalyst to sort of utilize that to wield its power. Um, let me ask you this: what, I mean, in the process of all these different wars and factions, was it mainly? Do they see the Quran as sort of like a catalyst to wield power, or were they just sort of trying to figure out how to phrase this question correctly? Did they, do they believe like the true causes that was to facilitate the move of like of just what Islam was at that time? Does that does my question make sense? So I, I let me let me phrase. It. Do we think so? Is kind of the question: Are these people kind of like cynical manipulators or true believers? Yeah, I mean, maybe a little bit of both. Like, you know, you think about weird you know, geopolitical movements, and sometimes people are, are utilizing something. They have an ulterior motive, right? So you think about, you know, here, like in the United States, you'll have like a, a past, you know, a, a politician who will show up at a church to sort of like say, hey, I'm, I'm here. I'm sort of like, I'm a, I'm a believer in, in, I'm a person of faith. And it kind of, they, they have like their segment of like the religious right. They want to capture their vote. But they also want, they got to capture all these other votes, right? So, like, in this, are they are they sort of adhering to Islam as a, as a means of political power, or are they true believers, or is it sort of a mishmash of both? I think, I think when you're looking at this sort of, especially, say, Omar and Ali, these men are 100% true believers. Okay. Right? They really, 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 really believe in the cause. Um. When it comes to Uthman, eh, I don't know. Um, but when it comes to Muawiyah, yeah, he's somebody who's much more like a sort of modern politician. So Muawiyah is the guy. They're actually the first Muslim we have coins minted from, and on his coins we actually have crosses on the coins hmm. because Muawiyah is presenting himself as a as a Muslim, but who's a benevolent governor and friend of Christians and Jews as well. So Muawiyah is a very, very competent leader. So he gets thrown under the bus in Islamic history because, you know, he went to war with Ali. But, you know, if you look at him, he was a very, very effective leader in a lot of ways and a great administrator, not so much of a conqueror, but somebody who's really able to 
you know, put a functioning state together. Mm -hmm. And probably it's his competence as a governor that meant that the Islamic world was durable enough to handle some of these civil wars yeah. later. Oh, okay. Yeah, so where, where does it continue from here? Because I, mean, I still am seeing this progression, the belief in the Quran, um, and, and sort of seeing this involvement and these like warring factions and tribes. But now, if you think of like Islam today, you have all these subsets, like you have the symbol of the, maybe, we'll probably get into it, like the symbol of the crescent on top of a mosque and the call to prayer and praying, you know, you know, praying the certain times per day. And like all the things that come with what Muslims pr traditionally practice, like how does that, how does that, how does that work in along the sort of like timeline of all these different tribes sort of saying we are the true successors? Yeah, well, you know, we're not there yet, right? Mm. We're, 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 the, a lot of these things haven't developed into mm. their okay. final forms at this point. So, you know, from there, right, the first generation are kind of fading away. They, they, all, they all die off. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, the, the caliphate fractures um, into several parts. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you've got, you know, you've got one general in Iraq, one guy called Al-Zubair in Medina, and then you've got the Karajites, the faction that killed Ali in Oman. And they've basically been there till this day. Um, Oman's super chill now, but they have their own completely unique sect of Islam called the Ibadi Muslims. Um, and, and so basically what happens at this point is then there's a guy called Abdul Malik who basically you know, starts fighting against all these different factions, reunifies the territory, and and basically cements the power of the sort of ruling family of the Umayyads. Yeah. Right. That's the tribe he's from, the Umayyad Caliphate. Um, and they then start continuing the conquest. And from the time of Muhammad's death, you have exactly 100 years of unstoppable Muslim conquests. Um, and there's basically, um, there's two places where they're stopped. The first is at Constantinople. So it's kind of like the last hold of the Byzantines yeah. in Asia, but they attack from like a la with a land and sea army, but the Byzantines successfully defend with the use of something called Greek fire. And then there's a guy called Charles Martel in Europe who hears about the Muslims and starts getting ready. Because at this point, Europe doesn't have any standing armies. This isn't the day of the Romans. Armies are gathered by yeah. militias, whereas the Muslims have a professional army at this point. And so they just like cut through these things like a knife through butter. Um, they, you know, they're on top of it. Charles Martel anticipates this, starts raising up a professional force. And right as the Muslims are, have conquered Spain and are about to enter France, he then um, defeats them at the Battle of Tours and basically stops the Muslim conquest there. Now, around this time, the, 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 the Islam is starting to formulate itself more. There's a guy called Wasil ibn Atta, mm -hmm. and he starts this school of thought called the Mu'tazilites. And the Mu'tazilites are actually a syncretistic school of Islam. And so they basically believe that, um, y yes, Allah has sent us the Quran, but now he's given us all these people and cultures we have access to. So we've conquered, you know, parts of India. We've conquered parts of the Greek world. We've, we've conquered the Library of Alexandria. We've conquered North Africa and Spain. And we have all these different ideas, which are suddenly under the same political administration. So um, they start, you know, being interested in all these different ideas that have come to the world and this, you know, pursuit of knowledge mm -hmm. as this kind of highest virtue and rationality. Um, Meanwhile, people from people who are from Muhammad's tribes, the tribe of Abbas, um, are growing um, uncomfortable with the Umayyad rule and start a revolt where they start taking territory from the Umayyad ruling dynasty. And then they basically invite all the Umayyad tribal leaders to um, like a feast and have their own red wedding called the Banquet of Blood, where all of them are killed except um, someone in Spain. So Spain stays under the Umayyads, and then everything else is under what's called, who called yeah. the Abbasids. Real quickly, what what's really blowing my mind here, you think about just like t like timelines or even like a time lapse. I like think about it's, we're, we're, in, we're in January 2020, 2024, and 
you think about what was going on in 1924 yeah. and, and all that's all that's happened just what I know about history from the 1920s till now that's a lot that's happened and yeah. we have access to so much more information now and to think that this small period of just 100 years and the main the really focal point isn't is all the subjugation of, of conquest by you know not just one sort of movement as a whole but all these sort of different warring factions I mean that's really I mean, thinking about what happened between that timeline is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it, it's crazy. So I think we're now about we're about 150 years mm -hmm. after Muhammad at this point. Yeah, when you have the, you know, the when you have the Abbasid revolt. Um, but this, but when the Abbasids take over, they really don't expand as much anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is what's known as the Islamic Golden Age. So this is the time where you know, the Muslim world has, you know, massive advances. Um, you know, Baghdad at the time was built by this, in this time period as the Abbasid capital. And, you know, you had like lit up streets. It was for the most part clean. You had the strongest armies, the best education. And you had something called the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, where all the literature of the world was translated into Arabic and people would study these things and come up with these like new invent inventions. Mm -hmm. So... That's where you get things like, you know, guitars, you get a coffee really starts to become a thing. Mm. Um, ice cream becomes a thing. Um, algebra. Um, and, and so, you know, my Muslim friends will say, you know, why does everyone think we're terrorists? We invented algebra. I'm like, <laughs> dude, that's why. Yeah. Well, I do have to give, I do have to give credit. Like I remember being, uh, in, I had like a 24 hour layover in Dubai in 20, in 2015 and man, Having some Arabic coffee that will cure. If there's anything that'll cure jet lag, that will take care of it. Like right. that's that's like Matt, I'm a coffee person. Like I, I sort of proceed with caution. Yeah. I, tr I tread light when it comes to Arabic coffee, so I do have to give Matt respect on that. But let me ask you this too: when you you're talking about the Islamic Golden Age, the I think I've heard it may have been you or just sort of like look just reading up and watching some videos on it. There's a isn't there a correlation between them getting the Library of Alexandria? to the Islamic golden age. I mean, there's, cause I mean, as they're conquesting, they're getting plethora of like wealth of knowledge of information from the inventors, the philosophers that seems to be just sort of, sort of like part of con of conquest. A consequence of conquest is that you sort of, you capture the wealth of information they've been accumulating. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's part of it. Um, but like people wanted to, a lot of people want to give the Muslims no credit for this, Yeah, which isn't, correct because the mongols captured a lot of libraries and left a lot of ruins behind them mm -hmm. right so yeah. just because you're conquering people with information doesn't mean you have the power to like utilize the information you capture right so the attitude in the muslim world right now at, well, at that time allowed them to make use of that information and you know take humanity forward at that point mm -hmm. um, and so people will say yeah well a lot of these contributions come from christians and jews living in the time okay sure but you still have a Muslim leadership that's able to say, okay, the the things that Christians and Jews are able to contribute to our society are worth having right now. Right. So you've at least got to give them credit for something yeah. in that time. And I think it's really, really important as Christians that we don't have like this cartoonish view of the Muslim world, right? Muslims, a Muslim living, you know, 1500 years ago and a Muslim... No, wait, no Muslims living 1,500 years ago. When a Muslim living 1,000 years ago, yeah. um, uh, a Muslim living 1,000 years ago and a Muslim today is an image bearer of God and a sinner, right? Um, and so there's good things Muslims have contributed to the world and good things Muslims have contributed to history. And just because we disagree with, you know, theology and are concerned about their eternity doesn't mean we can't, you know, celebrate the good parts of their culture as well in the contributions they've made to the world. And I think that's really important for us to do. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I was listening to um, an episode from theology podcast. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, yeah. but uh, they did an episode on the Islamic golden age. And they were just talking about how during this time, there was of course the Islamic philosophers that would get together with the Christian philosophers, the Jewish philosophers, they had like a very peaceful relationship within these academic circles. And a lot of what we know, or at least have a heavily influence from was their uh, interpreting of the works of Aristotle, like brought about like a, a big awakening during that time for the world. Um, I don't know. It was a really interesting episode that I was like, wow, I would have never known 
uh, any of this stuff. But yeah, I, I, I totally agree. We need to be able to give them credit where credit is due mm-hmm. for uh, specific things that were happening during that time. So, yeah. uh, so after giving them credit where credit is due, uh, we also have to give criticism where criticism is due, mm-hmm. right? Because um, while um, while this was a sort of tolerant time to, to you know to some extent because of this Muatas like philosophy, um, it didn't solve all of its problems that way. So if you were a Christian or a Jew disagreeing with the ruling school of philosophy, you could have a free life. If you were a Muslim who disagreed with this theology, straight to jail. Mm. So there's wow. this guy called Ibn Hanbal, yeah. who is what would be known as a traditionalist Muslim, much more akin to what you know we see today in the world. And Ibn Hanbal critiques the sort of leading Mu'tazilite school of thought. And because that school of thought is the official school of thought of the government, um, the guy called Caliph al-Mamun imprisons Ibn Hanbal for his, for his point of view. Um, which is a, you know, and, and this is, so there's no, there's not ultimately kind of freedom of speech in that sense, because you can't, you're not allowed to criticize the, you know, ruling system. And the reason that's such a dangerous game to play is because what, what happens when the people who disagree with you get power? And that's what happened. You have a guy called al Mutawakil, who's considered the last great caliph of the Islamic golden age. Um, and we're about, you know, 200 and... So now, we're, where, where are we? We're when when sort of like um, 861, mm-hmm. you know, 863 at this point, um, which is 200 years, you know, after Muhammad, um, around that, in that ballpark anyway, um, al Mutawakil changes his mind and he believes Ibn Hanbal, releases him from jail and imprisons the Muatazalites. Because one thing you have always had in Islam is an absolute union between religious power and um, and government power. Mm-hmm. So, you know, while, you know, we as Christians want to see God honoring laws in where we live, that's not the same thing as wanting to have, you know, Pastor Jeff be the president and supreme, you know, religious leader, right? There's, we, we understand the distinction in roles, mm-hmm. which Islam has never had in such a, you know, clear cut way. So the caliph gets involved in these things and starts suppressing this movement, which had really made the Islamic world prosper. Mm. And this begins the decline of the Islamic golden age. Um, there's a guy called Al Ghazali who's a, who writes a book called The Incoherence of the Philosophers, who says, look, um, if a fire burns thread, it's not because fire naturally burns thread. It's because Allah wills for this thread to burn up. Mm-hmm. So, um, so so there's these debates and what starts to formulate is a much more rigid Islam at this time. So Ibn, um, Ibn um, Hanbal has a student called Imam Bukhari. And Imam Bukhari starts to put together a book called Sahih al-Bukhari, which is basically finding all these stories about Muhammad, everything he said and did, and putting them together in written form. Mm -hmm. And so for the next, you know, hundred, so basically this starts to happen about 225 years after Muhammad. And then over the next 75 years, um, you know, they, they start to collate something that were known as the sitter, mm-hmm. which is basically they assess all of the things that are floating around that Muhammad said and did and figure out, okay, how far can we trace back this story according to generations? Okay, so this person heard it from this person who heard it from this person. And we have another source saying this person heard it from this person who heard it from this person who heard it from Muhammad himself. Yeah, And they basically um, collate the, the, what's known as the sahi, the, the sitter hadith, um, which are considered the reliable stories according to Sunni Islam of what you know everything Muhammad said and did categorized by what's reliable and knowable by the average Muslim, right? Mm-hmm. So at that point, um, that's where you start to get things like the contents of the five daily prayers. That's where you get um, the five pillars of Islam cemented. So that's from the Hadith. Muhammad says Islam is a house built on five pillars the Shahada, which is the confession that there's no God but God. Muhammad is his messenger. You've got the five daily prayers. You've got 
There's a cart which is taxes, kind of like Muslim social security. Um, the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and then um, fasting during Ramadan. Wow. That I mean that's that's so incredible. I mean that I mean you're talking about like after the fact of like this of just a timeline of just all these different warring factions and you have this golden age of Islam and then it's really sort of in the the closure of that period is where a lot of what we see like really today carried out amongst you know different sects of Islam whether it's you know Sunni Shia like those fundamental tenets that we see because I mentioned earlier you're like we're not there yet well. So now we're there, yeah. and it's something that really evolved really post, um, you know, post the uh, golden age uh, of Islam, where you see a lot of these things in play. Well, yeah, just it's like it emerges during the decline of the golden age, and so so for example, and and it's not to say that none of these ideas existed before then. Mm-hmm. It's just that that's when they kind of decide, okay, these are the ones we believe, and this is you know orthodoxy. So so for example, um, it became canon. Yeah, yeah. basically, but the. The, the one example of like a theological difference that kind of gets you know cemented at this time is the nature of the Quran. So the uh, the traditional Sunni Muslims believe the Quran has always existed um, as it exists currently is in uncreated form in in heaven mm-hmm. with Allah, and then it's only kind of like put into sort of you know spoken reveal at the time of Muhammad. Yeah. The Mu'tazilites believed that that constituted shirk. If the Quran's co-eternal with God, it would have to be God itself. Therefore, it has to be created. Um, and so they believe the Quran is created as Allah reveals himself through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad. So that's you know one point of theological difference between these two factions. And a lot of these, just like over time, a lot of these things get you know cemented by tradition rather than you know history. Mm-hmm fun example of this right um one thing everyone knows about islam is which uh, they they know that it's not isaac that abraham was commanded to sacrifice but ishmael Mm. but if you read the scholars in the islamic golden age like al-tabari he says that some hadith say that it's ishmael some hadith say that it's isaac and um it honestly makes most sense to me that it's isaac not ishmael so a lot of the early Muslims believed it was Isaac and not Ishmael who Abraham was commanded to sacrifice. And it's only really later that everybody knows it's Ishmael. It's definitely Ishmael. But that's mm-hmm. not in the Quran. It's not in the early Islamic sources. That's something that's kind of formulated later. Yeah. And even like within their theology, isn't there a fundamental like presupposition or reason why they choose Ishmael? And it has to do with uh, what they believe as far as uh, prophetic succession? I mean, succession? I, I mean, kind of, but... I mean, they don't not believe in Isaac as a prophet. Right. Right. So they believe Muhammad is descended from Ishmael. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the idea that Ishmael is a prophet is in the Quran and that Muhammad right. is descended from, you know, Ishmael is certainly in early Islam. But it doesn't necessitate he's the one that sacrificed. Right. So now we have sort of on the tail end, like to the Golden Age, now you see like the, the fundamental tenets like historically leading up to like what we see now. Um, as far as what is practiced out, called a prayer, uh, you know, the five pillars, um, where the symbol of the crescent, like where does that fit in? Was that something that was evolved later on or what, what does that actually represent? Yeah. That's way later. Way later. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's like, we can hold off. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll, we'll hold off. That's, okay. that's way later. Yeah. What well, was, it's interesting too, because like I see these things and there's this, there's this tendency to look at all those aspects and say, okay, well, this all started here, not seeing as this evolving period of hundreds, hundreds of years. That's, it's interesting. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's like, you know, crazy how much development there is. Yeah. And all the while the Shia are developing their own sources and their own, you know, beliefs about things, you know, yeah. in their own, you know, corner of the world. Um, and they actually start as the, as, as the Abbasid Caliphate is declining, the Shias actually start their own caliphate in North Africa, um, and actually start and actually start you know taking over all of you know North Africa as mm-hmm. this is as this is happening. Yeah, um, and so wh- what's so what's the next step after that after this? So you have some of the fundamental uh, periods uh, happening. I mean the fundamental tenets of Islam as we know today, but then historically, where does it go from there? So, um, one thing lots of people don't know 
is uh, the thing that really brought an end to the sort of Islamic golden age is uh, the Mongols, actually. So Genghis Khan. Um, At least yeah, that's what it, comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. His, yeah. And it's specifically uh, Hugalu Khan, who was the sort of successor of mm. Genghis Khan in the region. So this is, at this time also, um, you also, that's when the sort of crusaders and the Mongols are sort of, you know, two separate issues. And they start, you know, arising at the same time. So, you know, in the, so you've got the crusaders, you know, starting, the crusades kind of starting in the sort of, you know, um, you know, after the great schism in the sort of, you know, 1100s sort of realm. Mm -hmm. And what's happened there is they've always had a stream of Christian pilgrims going to Jerusalem from, you know, Europe and Asia. And one of the caliphs, you know, cuts off those pilgrims. And all this time, there's always this military threat of Muslims taking over more of Europe at this point and trying to, you know, wipe out the Byzantines. Mm -hmm. They're kind of constantly kind of in this cold war with each other. Yeah. So the Church of the East writes to the Church of the West and says, uh, dear Catholics, uh, we're kind of in a bind right here and we're not allowed to go to Jerusalem anymore. This interests both of us. Um, please help us recapture Jerusalem. So at this point, the Crusaders come from Europe and manage to, success, they manage to kind of conquer Jerusalem and to sort of successfully hold it for, mm -hmm. you know, a thousand if no for like a, you know for a, a pretty long time yeah until um and and the at this time the abbasid caliphate has been losing territory to the fatimid caliphate in north africa as well hmm. um so the, it's fractured it's, it's much less centralized now um because one thing that's been happening since the sort of as the islamic golden age declines is they lose more and more you know power and it takes more and more, you know, it takes more and more you know, local governors to make things happen, which means that they gain more and more power and they call those people sultans. One of these guys is a Kurdish guy called Salahuddin. And Salahuddin uh, manages to defeat, but there's two things. He manages to infiltrate the Fatimid government, overthrow it, and bring back the North African territory to the Muslims. And he manages to defeat the Crusaders in Jerusalem and take back Jerusalem for the Muslims as well. And basically, you know, reunifies the power of the Abbasid Caliphate briefly. Is that the uh, is that the guy that's depicted in Kingdom of Heaven? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I have, yeah. A, I have a visual now. <laughs> yeah. I am not those men. Yeah. I am Salahuddin. Yeah. My favorite, Salahuddin. just so you know, my favorite line from that movie where, where Saladin says, uh, it's like when uh, ba when Balin asks him, he's like, what is Jerusalem to you? And he goes, With nothing. nothing. He turns around, everything. everything. <laughs> Such a great line. No, people, I, I actually employ that when people ask me where I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> um, because, you know, I have a kind of a blended accent at this point. British yeah. people think I sound American. Americans think I sound British. So people ask, where are you from? I'm like, nowhere. Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Hey, Andrew, what 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 thoughts come to mind with this uh this this wild linear timeline that we're on? Yeah, this is the time to talk about the Crusades, by the way. Yeah. So let's oh, okay. uh, let's let's get into that now if we want to. Yeah. Uh Andrew, any, any thoughts a... what anything that comes to mind historically, uh with what he's talked about? No, it's just it's uh fascinating, man. It's uh it's 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 awesome. It's been captivating so far. This last fifty five minutes has been great it's been great i can't wait to get into the the crusades i've learned a lot so i'm just really appreciative of you and all of the research that you have done man just praise god for that i'm i'm excited mm -hmm. yeah well well this so what's interesting too is that you know you, what you're seeing so far is really internal tribal warfare there's not necessarily like a lot of it doesn't seem like a lot of like fighting opposition. aside from the one you said there was the one person who stopped the advancement prior to that like you said about 20 right. minutes ago charles motel right but it seems to me that this is more internal, still internal, like fighting, tribaling for who's the true successor of Muhammad. Like that seems to be that along as, as they're expanding the crusade. When you think of the crusades, you're, you're really looking at like European Anglo-Saxon people like versus, you know, the, the advance, the advancement of, of Muslims. And so it seems to me like this is where, where does it go? What's the starting point to where 
it kind of became like an internal tribal warfare thing to, you know, Anglo-Saxon or whatever you want to call it versus like Muslim. Because that's usually when I think of like crusades, that's what comes to mind. Yeah. Well, the, the funny thing about the crusades is um, in the West, we think of this as some sort of like massive civilization level war. Mm-hmm. The Muslims at the time thought of them as a slight inconvenience. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, um, they, they don't even they don't even think of them as the, the way they describe them as the Farange. They just see these these like French barbarians who are kind of like temporarily, you know, causing problems. But there's no like, oh no, we're about to lose everything kind of thing. And you know, this is an existential threat to us. Right. It's just like, oh, what a, what an annoying headache. It's almost like you know you find rats in your basement or cockroaches or scorpions because we're in Arizona, mm-hmm. and you've got to you know call pest control and get them out. Yeah. So it's like it's it's more it's more like they they see it more akin to the American war in Afghanistan yeah. than like World War Two or something. Hmm. Yeah, what's well, also interesting too is that again my my it's this is such a fascinating thing because you're talking about how, you know, there's relationships that, you know, Christians and Jews would have with Muslims, right? Throughout, you know, and, and throughout their society, even throughout, you know, the whole part of the time of this like this conquest. And what's very interesting, I want to get your thoughts on this. In Kingdom of Heaven, the what's the name of the king? Like who had the leprosy, who only lived till thirty, and had the Edward, Edward Norton played in Kingdom of Heaven, but then he died. He had leprosy in his face, and so he had like the. Um, I forgot his name. Yeah, I forgot his name. I, my, I had to look him up. But uh, in it, like he had sort of like this friendship or relationship with Saladin, like, and so you kind of had that, like, there. Um, yeah. So like in this, where was the like, King Baldwin? King Baldwin. King Baldwin. Yeah. Um, so you kind of you saw this like, sort of like interesting like friendship and association that people had. Like, what was the starting point of like the Crusades? Like, when when did it, when did it become like a notable thing? Was it kind of like who struck first? Or was it a resp- was that a response to something that happened at a particular place like World War II for like us getting into the Pacific with Japan was obviously Pearl Harbor? Um, you think about you know there's always these things that happen like the Mex the American Mexican War started with the Alamo right. Like what what's what was the starting point for? Well, I mean, I think the clear starting point um, is that the Muslims conquered a bunch of the Byzantine territory and were trying to conquer Europe as well. Right. Like, um, you know, it's it's, it's like the, the, the a lot of the time it's kind of you know frustrating talking to people about empires and colonialism and conquest because. Mm. In general, what I can see is that with a lot of my Muslim friends, colonialism is a word that's, you know, bad when someone else does it, but great when they do it. Right. So you talk about, you know, Spanish colonialism of the new world, which again, I also disagree with. Mm -hmm. But um, when they talk about Muslims conquering Spain, it's like when the Muslims liberated Spain from who? The Spanish. (laughs) Um, So you've you've got all this. And then again, the trigger point is the Muslim leader of Jerusalem stops Christian pilgrims from being able to go to Jerusalem. Mm. And and that's, you know, it's like to you or I, that's not a big deal because we're Protestants that don't believe in pilgrimages. Yeah. But to people who believe in pilgrimages, it's kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back, basically. Um, and that's kind of the, you know, trigger event that makes them think, okay, time to push back now. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so then... Where so what what sort of like if you give a just a cliff note summary of like what where where did the Crusades ultimately what was the long lasting effect of the Crusades that had on Islam what what did Islam look like post uh, post Crusades again not really that different okay because um again it'd be it'd be like if like China came and it'd be like if North Korea came and like took over Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a headache nationally. It's a little embarrassing. Yeah. But like your day to day life isn't really going to change all that much. Mm. Um, like you'd be you, you, like you'd care about it for like two months, and then it's like ah, that wasn't really like a huge deal to us anyway. Yeah. Uh, but we should probably we got to get to that eventually. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the you know the the to do list of you know the caliph, you think how many frontiers they have. They have African tribes. They have you know Turkish tribes on the north. And they have this, this sort of Asian, they have China on the other side and they have the Asian steppes, which is this 
you know, current, there's always sort of mystery. And then they have a frontier with India as well. Yeah. So they're, they're dealing with all these different cultures and there's threat of war and there's wars between all of them at different times. Mm -hmm. And then this force of French people, how is how they think of them, come yeah. and just like bite off a chunk of their land. And it's surprising. Mm -hmm. It's embarrassing, but it's not like, oh, there's some existential threat to us now. Right. So Islam itself doesn't change a ton there, at least not what we can observe. It's what comes next, which changes everything. Hmm. And so why don't we do this? We'll leave people in the cliffhanger because I think we've gone about 50 minutes. I'm curious about what will be next. So we're going to wrap up part two. Uh, this is, uh, dude, so fascinating. I mean, there, there's so many working pieces. I think this will just be helpful for people because a lot of times we look – we look at history in, a very, in very simplistic terms and just understanding this is an involvement of something like hundreds of years. And like even the dialogues that you've had with, with the Muslims who are in your area in Seattle, like they're, this is their worldview is a culmination of all of this uh, one way or the other. So I think like having that is so helpful, is so helpful. I definitely would agree. Um, so let's go ahead and do this. We're going to go and wrap up part two. I'm curious. We're going to find out about this cliffhanger uh, going into part three of this extended series on Islam. So all that being said, uh, thank you all for listening in. We'll talk to you next time on Cultish. Talk to you all soon. Can't wait to get the next episode in the series? Then join the Cultish All Access. Get early release of these series to quench those binging desires along with a host of amazing perks. Head over to thecultishshow.com or follow the link in the description and start listening to the full series while supporting this mission.